Captain's Log Supplemental. Of note, coalition forces conducted a strike resulting in the death of Iraqi national Ab Abdel Basit al-Iraqi, who was emir of ISIL's Middle East external networks, including against American, Turkish, and European targets. Abdel Basit was struck and killed November 12th in Raqqa, Syria. He was a key facilitator for ISIL's external operations routes through Turkey and was responsible for attacks within the Middle East. Along with these external attacks and plots, he's also been connected to convoy reconnaissance and facilitation extremist travel, uh, finances, and weapons in the region. His death degrades and delays ISIL's current plots against regional targets and deprives them of capable senior manager who provided oversight over many external attacks. In Iraq, Iraqi security forces continue making progress in clearing areas of Daesh presence in Mosul and have seen fierce resistance that they had planned for and that we've been talking about for months. This is a neighborhood to neighborhood fighting, particularly in the east, and the Iraqi security forces have moved deliberately and exercised a laudable level of restraint in an effort to protect civilian life. Daesh have done the opposite, taking human shields, dressing as ISF, and arresting people who react positively to their presence, arresting civilians for having phones and using tunnels to infiltrate c civilian neighborhoods. This is extremely tough fighting, but the ISF have continued their advance, liberating Nimrud this past week after initial tough fighting, followed by Daesh retreating toward Mosul. As many of you know, the enemy destroyed a lot of ancient architecture at Nimrud and then sold artifacts on the black market in order to finance their operations. This is another in the string of atrocities conducted by Daesh, and the evidence of these events mounts as they continue to lose territory. Finally, I'd like to show a video taken near Tel Afar. Jeff, if you could uh, roll that video. Well, the, uh, the video that you're seeing is uh, of a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device factory near Tel Afar. As you can see, there are some pretty significant secondary explosions as that's taken out from an airstrike. The photo that you're looking at is a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device that was captured, captured in Peshmerga territory and it's now used uh, to train Peshmerga forces at one of our training sites in northern Iraq. As you can see, it's reminiscent of a Mad Max vehicle with armored plating in the front to protect the driver until he can detonate the explosives he's carrying on board. The coalition has used strikes mostly from the air to destroy these anywhere that they can be found. Around Mosul, we've destroyed 60 plus since the Iraqi forces commenced their operation to liberate the city on October 17th. And I'm sure you recall that we destroyed hundreds of these during the shaping operations in the months that leading up to the Mosul operation. Okay, so now I'll be delighted to take your questions. We'll start with... Can you... Uh, Turkey has uh, today been talking about how close they are in getting into al-Bab. Can you give us a sense of are they within a couple kilometers of getting in? What kind of resistance uh, are you hearing that they're meeting? And, uh, and I have a second uh, follow-up. Uh, they're very close. The last I heard they were within a couple of kilometers. I just checked in with uh, our op center. Uh, they've not yet uh, moved into Al-Bab and taken the city, but uh, they are very, very close. Encountering some pretty tough resistance, they do expect to be able to power through that. The uh, Shiite militias, the hostile Shabi, are, are now moving on Tel Afar. They're very close to it. How do you see that offensive going? And are you concerned about their committing human rights violations against the Sunnis and the Sunni areas that they, they'll move into? Well, what, uh, what we know about the, uh, the popular mobilization forces uh, is that they've moved uh, out uh, southwest of Tel Afar. They're not in the city. They're very close to it. 
uh, and that move is intended to uh, block any egress area for Dash who are in Mosul. Uh, it'll block them so that they won't be able to move westward as the pressure inside Mosul increases. So that's the Iraqi plan. Uh, that's uh, what's been briefed to us, and that's what we've observed on the battlefield thus far. Once they get to the edge of Talafar, they're very close to it, as you have said. Will they move into the city itself? Well, what, I've, what I have heard is that uh, the plan is for them to uh, stay outside the city and that the Iraqi army uh, will indeed be the force that goes into Tal Afar um, and that they'll remain in their blocking positions. That's, that's what I've seen uh, of the plan, and thus far that's what's happened. And if I could ask you about the um, SDF, you mentioned there were two axes of advance that were going to converge. This is advance on Raqqa? Yeah, that's correct. It's, uh, it's advancing toward Raqqa, and then they'll converge uh, and then back clear the pocket that they created with their advance. So um, they're moving toward Raqqa, uh, and then they'll back clear the area that they create on the two axes of advance. How do you assess their progress so far? Well, they're on plan. We've uh, dropped about 250 munitions to support their operations, and these are against DASH targets, uh, vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices, fighting positions, they're fighters. So uh, they've been successful, and they've been able to move uh, in the directions that they intended to. Uh, they've met moderate resistance along the way, but they've been able to execute their plan. Well, is it, have U.S. advisors entered the city uh, as the CTS kind of makes progress going neighborhood by neighborhood? Have they at any point entered the city and maybe have left or are in the city now? Could you, could you talk a little bit about whether or not uh, U.S. personnel or coalition personnel have actually breached the city limits? Well, um, what I would say about that is that uh, the uh, uh, Iraqi forces have gotten about a third of the way into eastern Mosul. That's a very small area, and we're not going to comment on the position of our U.S. or coalition advisors in relation to those forces. Um, they remain behind the forward line of troops. They're there in an advisory role. And one of the things that's very important to understand here is that the co it's not the role of the coalition to close on the enemy. Uh, and try to take that terrain, that's a job for the Iraqi security forces, and that's a, an enduring theme. So we're not going to get into the exact position of uh, U.S. or coalition forces in Mosul. That's not something we're going to do. Question about Mosul, please. Um, how we, you're, you're talking about the, uh, the, the tough fight uh, between um, in the eastern part of Mosul. Uh, how, how is that complicating the presence of civilians um, in that battle space. How is that complicating the potential for airstrikes uh, there to the support of the ISF? And can you describe the efforts to prevent civilian casualties on that battle space? Any time that you have uh, dense urban warfare like you see in Mosul, uh, it's a very challenging situation, but we do have the capability to strike enemy targets. Uh, what that does is it influences the manner in which we conduct our strikes. Now, we continue to use our intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, our eyes in the sky, uh, in order to verify targets, and we continue to coordinate those uh, with the Iraqis, both in our operation centers and on the ground. Uh, and we also think about things like the size of the weapons that we use. Now, uh, the, the Air Force and, and our, uh, uh, all of our coalition forces have 2,000-pound bombs. We also have small diameter bombs, 250 pounds. And so we might uh, influence the types of choices that we make with regard to what weapons are used. We are following the Iraqi lead. They've shown a considerable amount of restraint with the manner in which they've advanced into the city. They've tried very hard to protect civilians. We see some of the open source reports with Iraqi security forces sharing their rations, sharing their medical supplies with civilians. That's a pretty laudable effort. We think it's uh, something that all Iraqis ought to be proud of. Uh, 
uh, and we're going to follow suit with that. But make no mistake, we will take every opportunity that we can to remove capabilities that Dash would use on the battlefield in order to create danger. We'll take every opportunity to do that. Can I ask you one last question about this Mad Max vehicle you described here? You said it's, a, it's now uh, being used for training. Um, is there a standardized kind of concept for how these vehicles are created and, and what kind of uh, training is it involved with? The, what, what, are the pers what are the PESH doing with this uh, vehicle? Well, as far as, uh, you know, that vehicle, that is a captured vehicle-borne improvised explosive device. So it was stopped with 50 caliber weapons fire. Uh, as you can see, the, the, uh, the front of it has uh, a significant amount of armor plating. And what that does is it protects the driver so he can maneuver uh, the BBIED into position and then detonate uh, the explosives that are in there. So as, the, the, uh, as we conduct our training, and this is something that's been going on for some months uh, with the Peshmerga and with the Iraqi security forces, we knew that they were going to go into a dense uh, urban type fight in order to take Mosul. Uh, and so they use this capability and uh, teach the uh, forces how to react to that threat uh, and don the appropriate weapon uh, so that they can stop those. Thanks. Can you rule out that U.S. forces are inside Mosul? Uh, no, I cannot. We, we're not going to verify the location of uh, U.S. or coalition forces in Mosul. That's, uh, that would just be inappropriate to do that. Uh, we do remain behind the forward line of troops. It's not our role uh, to take terrain or close with the enemy. They're there as advisors. Uh, as the Iraqis move, if they need us, uh, we'll go where they need us. How important are those U.S. advisors to this fight? Well, there's no question that uh, U.S. advisors are in harm's way. Uh, we do advise the CTS. Uh, they are in the thick of a very tough battle, so uh, there is a significant amount of danger here, especially on the eastern axis as they moved into the city. They moved through some very tough resistance as they've approached the city. Uh, our advisors are close by, uh, so the enemy does get a vote, but our, our, uh, our forces are not really uh, going to be trifled with. They will most certainly defend themselves, and they are there strictly to uh, advise and assist the Iraqi security forces, and in this case, the CTS. How many more months will this Mosul operation take? It's very difficult to predict how long it's going to take. As all the Iraqi security forces converge on the city, and the Iraqis continue to maneuver through there, and we continue to conduct our strikes, we've conducted more than 4,000 so far. Uh, dropping, uh, dropping bombs on uh, dash targets, and that's killed hundreds of their fighters. It's removed hundreds of their fighting positions and weapons. Uh, we've taken out more than 80 tunnels, taken out more than 60 vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices. Eventually, the enemy is going to break. Uh, it's going to take quite some time, and what they've done, all these th tactics that they've used to increase danger for the civilians there, what that means is it's going to be a very deliberate fight, very dangerous fight for the forces that are advancing there. Uh, but we'll continue striking the enemy until, ultimately, uh, the Iraqis are going to take that city. And that is, as you know, uh, the Daesh capital in Iraq. Uh, it's going to be taken from them, and then they'll be back to just being a garden variety terrorist group. And uh, the Iraqis will be in mop-up duty then. Lastly, how tenacious is ISIS in this fight? Well, I, you know, you, you have to say they're tenacious. I would also say they're despicable because what they've done is uh, they poison the air that uh, Iraqi children breathe. Uh, they've uh, lit a bunch of oil fires that also poison the air. They've used vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices and detonated them in civilian areas. They've hid behind civilians. In a, it's just a cowardly tactic. They've driven millions of people from their homes, and they've killed tens of thousands of people. Um, so really, um, while they are certainly uh, you know, a, a, a very tough and adaptive enemy, really what they are is a despicable enemy with absolutely no legitimacy whatsoever using cowardly tactics.
you said the Iraqi army will be the force that enters the city. Is the Iraqi army prepared to do so in the near future or have difficulties with Mosul sort of slowed that down? My understanding is the Iraqis have adequate force in order to take Tal Afar as well. They'll do so on the timeline of their choosing. Uh, they're going to continue operations in Mosul. Um, we're not going to put a timeline on Tel Afar. Transition, has there been any requests from the Iraqi government uh, to meet with U.S. commanders to go over any kind of what comes next or concerns about the you know, incoming administration or questions? Is there, does anything like that happen with, with, the, with the, you know, the Combined Joint Task Force commanders of Townsend? Are any uh, aware of any such requests? Indeed, what I've seen is that everyone has remained focused on the task at hand which is a very difficult, difficult fight to liberate Mosul. Uh, the Iraqis have stayed on that. And it's the appropriate thing to stay on because it's a very tough fight, and it's going to take some time for us to get through that. Security Forces Airmen from the 821st Contingency Response Group are responsible for the security and safeguarding of the Q-West airfield in northern Iraq. Since the 821st CRG's arrival in mid-October, Security Forces personnel have secured an additional kilometer perimeter around the airfield, hardening defenses and freeing up security resources for supply operations. The airfield is the central logistical hub for supplies and fuel for coalition forces.